wanted to learn how to preach, there'd be no better example to follow than that of Jesus himself. Today on Truth For Life, as we continue our series called The Pastor's Study, Volume 3, Alistair Begg describes what we can learn from Jesus' earthly ministry and teaching. We begin today in Luke chapter 4. Now what I want to do in this day's work of Jesus is simply identify the scenes for us. Scene 1, you will notice, takes place in the synagogue. Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he began to teach the people. Later on, when the Pharisees and the guards asked why, when the Pharisees asked the guards why it was that they hadn't arrested Jesus and brought him in, the guards replied, No one ever spoke the way this man does. The words of Jesus gripped the minds of his listeners. They reached the conscience of those who were paying attention, and he was able to get to their hearts with a laser like directness. Ha! cries the man in verse 34. A startling interruption as Jesus is unfolding the truth. A demon-possessed man, Jesus of Nazareth, you come to destroy us. I know who you are. You're the Holy One of God. Now, Jesus doesn't get into a dialogue with him. There's somebody who could say, well, we learn here how to deal with interruptions when we're preaching. Well, we do in part, actually. Don't get into a dialogue with a person. We cannot do what Jesus did, but in this case, he simply grants the man deliverance. With two terse statements, he displays his power and authority. Be quiet and come out of him. Having decisively repelled the devil's temptations in the wilderness, it's no surprise to discover that the devil now is employing de demonic possession as a means of opposing Christ's ministry and the establishing of the kingdom. Indeed, John tells us, remember in 1 John, that one of the reasons that the Son of God had appeared was to destroy the evil one's work. And every time, as here, when Jesus cast out an evil spirit, the ultimate overthrow of Satan's kingdom was being anticipated. And so the man is instantly delivered. And despite being thrown in among the people, he is unharmed. And then the reaction of the people is there in verse 36. This dramatic display of God's power is akin to what the disciples would afterwards realize when Jesus calmed the storm on the lake, when they said, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the waves obey him? And all the people were amazed and said, What is this teaching? With what authority does he do this? And so the evil spirits are in no doubt that their goose is cooked, in verse 37, the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. But it's interesting, even in their response, what is this teaching, they say? Jesus says, this is the kind of teaching that changes lives. This is the kind of teaching that I want others to do. I want you, he says to the apostles, to go out now in the power of the Holy Spirit and to the things that you've learned. I want you to teach and teach other men and teach faithful men so that they in turn may teach. This is the apostolic succession. Now, from all of the activity of the hour or so in the synagogue in Capernaum, it then moves to scene 2. Verse 38, Jesus leaves the synagogue, and now he's in the home of Simon, invited out for lunch after the Sunday service. Why don't we go over to my home, says Peter, or my mother-in-law's home, I should say. Actually, in passing, you will notice that's rather inconvenient information, isn't it, for some seeking to enforce celibacy. Now, Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever. She was in the grip of something that had laid her low. And in response to a request, Jesus decides to help her. He bends over, he rebukes the fever, and it leaves her. Well, you notice how quickly and completely she was transformed. Now, you see, what is, what is Luke doing here? He's letting it be known that this uh, outworking of what Jesus has just been saying in the synagogue in Nazareth, the Spirit of the Lord is now upon me. Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And all of a sudden, as he walks out from there, here comes this demon-possessed man, and Jesus says, right, you get out of him, and you be quiet, and let's move on. He then moves into the home of Simon Peter. Simon Peter's mother-in-law is sick to, uh, to the point of uselessness, and, and Jesus bends over her, and he puts her back on her feet again. Incidentally, all of the healings that you have of Jesus are instantaneous, dramatic, and verifiable, unlike the contemporary claims at healing. Beware of going down that path. 
God is able to heal. He chooses sovereignly to intervene at times. But we should be very, very careful and hesitant about holding out to people the kind of hopes and dreams that they so desperately long for and yet are so patently not God's normative practice in our day. Most of my friends who have apparently been healed have just stumbled and bumbled along in their lives. But this individual was up on her feet. In fact, she made lunch. They didn't have to wait around for a year and a half to find out if the healing had actually been a real healing or not. People phoning up all the time said, did his mother not really get healed or what happened to her? Oh, no, she'd been back in her bed 14 or 15 times. No, there's none of that at all. Laid low on her feet. Here's lunch. Let's go. In other words, the making of lunch is not only an expression of her cure, but it's also an expression of her gratitude. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Jesus touched her life and changed her, and she stood up and began to wait on them. Beware of that kind of devotional preaching that can so easily come out of a phrase like that, that kind of spiritualizing that we can immediately do. You go to a passage like that, and you get to, she got up at once and began to wait on them. And so it goes something like this. You know, I know that a number of you have been laid low recently. Well, Jesus is the one who can come along and touch you and get you up, and you can at once begin to minister to him. So why don't you, you know, that kind of thing? It's got nothing at all to do with the passage, but you can do it. And indeed, your congregation will be intrigued by your ability to do it. But five minutes after you're finished, they won't have a clue really what you were doing. We teach the Bible by teaching the Bible. So scene one is in the synagogue. Scene two is in Simon uh, Peter's uh, mother-in-law's house. Scene three is at sunset with the crowds. Now it says, Look, when the sun was setting, the people brought to Jesus all who had various kinds of sicknesses, and laying his hands on each one, he healed them. Now, you see, the preaching of Jesus had authority. That's what we discovered in verse 32. They were amazed at his teaching. In verses 33 to 37, we discover that his word has exercising power. Even the demons come out. His touch has healing power, as we discover here in this beautiful sun-setting scene. You see, the wonders that Jesus performs are indications of the fulfillment of what he has just said in Luke 4. And what Luke is providing for his readers is the awareness of this, this anticipation, this looking forward to all of the finality of this, which has now dawned in the earthly ministry of Jesus. It surely is a wonderful picture of the kindness of Christ, is it not? The kind of people that were being brought to Jesus were not the kind of people who hosted parties for visiting preachers. The kind of people who were being brought to Jesus were not the kind of local welcoming committee, you know, that you get when you're invited to go and speak someplace. The fairly well put together, the well presented people, you know, who have got a nice house and can bring you up there and put you in the different places. Not that these people are bad people or are doing the wrong thing, but it's just a different group of people, isn't it? The hymn writer Henry Towles in 1823, actually lived from 1823 to 1890, has a fantastic hymn on this that begins at even, in evening, ere just as the sun was set, the sick, O Lord, around thee lay. Oh, in what various pains they met. Oh, with what joy they went away. Once more it's eventide, and we, oppressed with various ills, draw near. What if thy form we cannot see? We know and feel that thou art here. O Savior Christ, our woes dispel. For some are sick, and some are sad, and some have never loved thee well, and some have lost the love they had, and some have found the world is vain, yet from the world they break not free, and some have friends who give them pain, and haven't sought a friend in thee. And none, O Lord, have perfect rest, for none are wholly free from sin. And they who fain would serve thee best are conscious most of wrong within. O Savior Christ, thou too art man. Thou hast been troubled, tempted, tried. Thy kind but searching glance can scan the very wounds that shame would hide. Thy touch has still its ancient power. No word from thee can fruitless fall. Here in this solemn evening hour, 
and in thy mercy heal us all. It's a wonderful old hymn. I bet many of you have never even heard it and probably never sung it. But Christ's silencing of the demonic points to the fact that he wants no insurrection on the basis of the demonic's awareness of who he is. No false misunderstanding of the basis of his messiahship. And when it came, if you like, to letting it be known that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God, uh, when he decided that he would get it out and market it, you know, if he was choosing a PR man, he wasn't interested in using the demonics to fulfill the opportunity for him. And so he rebuked them and wouldn't allow them to speak. Scene one in the synagogue. Scene two in the home. Scene three in the setting sun. And scene four at daybreak in a solitary place. At daybreak, Jesus went out to a solitary place. He leaves the city unnoticed. He goes out to seek quietness after all of the demands of the previous hours. And yet the people are looking for him. And when they came to where he was, they tried to keep him from leaving them. They wanted to retain him. They wanted to keep him for themselves. Maybe they wanted to say, you know, Jesus has actually come and settled in our place now. He's the teacher in our synagogue. You know who we've got as the teacher in our synagogue? We have Jesus of Nazareth. He's our rabbi. It's a great temptation to want to keep Jesus to yourself, isn't it? There's church congregations that apparently want to keep Jesus to themselves. I can only assume they do because they'd never tell anybody else about him. Some of them are so tied up in their theological underwear that they're frightened if they do, the wrong people might actually get saved. So they're actually afraid of the universal appeal of the gospel because they don't really know what to do with it. Some congregations just seem smug in their own self-sufficiencies. That's why you won't find hardly any of the marginalized people there. You don't find many of the sick or the dying or the limping or the lame. You don't find many people with... with five different places in their face pierced. You don't find many people with their hair sticking up in unimaginable ways. You don't find these people there because those, those people haven't heard the word that is coming out, that there is a Jesus who is alive and he transforms lives and he fills, uh, them, uh, fills the empty with good things and he, and he sends the hungry home filled. We're responsible for that. Our congregations will become like us. Our emphases will become our congregation's emphasis. You will never have an evangelistic congregation without an evangelistic pastor. You will never have your people sharing their faith if you do not share your faith. If you create the impression that the whole operation is us four, no more, shut the door, people will be very glad with that. And as soon as they filled it up to the requisite numbers, then they'll be glad just that's fine. We don't really need any more. We don't really need anything. We are sufficient. We are fed. We are well. And the Spirit of God comes and says, you're wretched, poor, blind, and miserable. I'm standing at the door. I'm trying to get in here. And it's small wonder that so many of the disenfranchised are having a difficulty getting in here because I am the Lord of glory and I'm having difficulty getting in. I'm standing at the door and I'm knocking. Jesus, we don't want you to go away. We love you, Jesus. I understand that. We love, we love the fact that we get to hear you speak all the time, Jesus, and we want you to stay so that we can just have a wonderful time with you. We know it's important for us to be discipled. We want to be discipled by Jesus. We want to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to become the Dead Sea, Jesus. We want everything to flow in and nothing to flow out. Jesus says, well, thanks. It's a wonderful invitation. I'd like to stay and be your pastor, but I've got to get on now. Verse 43, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. You see the clarity of his purpose? See the importance of the call of God? Well, why are you doing what you're doing today, Jesus? Because that is why I was sent. 
What are you planning to do tomorrow, Jesus? I'm going to preach the kingdom of God to other towns. Why? Because that is why I was sent. Now, people say to us, well, why is it that you're having to study your Bible as much? Because that is the task that has been entrusted to me. He has given me as a gift to the church. You may think that sounds presumptuous, and frankly, it amazes me that God would have looked down on the likes of me and, and given me as a gift to the church. The ascended Christ gave gifts to the church, and some were to be pastors and teachers, and, and he made me a pastor and a teacher, and I know I'm not the best. In fact, I don't think I'm even in the top 25%, but, it, but I want you to know that I'm serious about it, and I want to serve you, and I want to preach the gospel, and I want to see you uh, growing in, in, in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus. And I'd love if you would pray to that end, because I'm sure that if you would pray for me, then I would be better able to do what it is I've been asked to do. In fact, if you think it's bad now, it's going to get much worse the longer I stay here. Because I've been here a couple of years with you now, and it has dawned on me that you think that you, the reason you brought me here was to do everything, that you were actually a group of people who needed a minister and so that I could minister to you and for you and so on. But I want to teach you from Ephesians, and I want to show you that the gifts of pastor and teacher were given so that I might be able, through the power of the Spirit, by the Word of God, to edify you so that you could go out and be the minister, so that you could do all of the works that are so necessary to do. It's a hard place to get to, but it's a very necessary place to get to. Not out of a sense of self-preservation, because it will demand the best out of us. It's far easier for me to run around and try and do things on my own than it is to step back and say, go ahead. And the smaller the situation, the greater the danger, that we try it. And we diminish things. Well, we're off the point. The point is simply that Jesus kept on preaching in public and in private. In Q&A sessions, one-on-one, -on -one, he announced the kingdom. He called people to faith. He trained his disciples. He explained the scriptures. And finally, he gets them all around him, and he says, As the Father has sent me, so send I you to see unbelieving people become the committed followers of Jesus Christ. And as the camera backs off and we go into a long shot, we just have this picture of Jesus moving off now from Capernaum. And the camera zooms away ahead, and we just look over the horizon of the next town. And then we're given a close-up shot of the synagogue. And then it comes back again to Christ, and we see him moving inexorably towards his next appointment. That's our calling, brethren. We've got places to go. We've got people to meet. We've got one message to proclaim Jesus Christ and him crucified. We've got one Bible from which to speak. It's in our hands. We need to study it. And that's why we call this basics. Because this is about as basic as you can get. Your wife says, what did you learn? You're going to say, nothing I didn't know. And I'm going to say, hallelujah. If we can remember to pray for one another, that whatever else happens to us, and wherever God takes us or puts us down, that we will endeavor, despite the fact that we know none of us are sufficient for these things, that we will endeavor to keep our heads, to endure hardship, to do the work of an evangelist, and to discharge all the duties of our ministries. And we do so in the confidence that God has set us to the task, and that because of His goodness, he will honor his word. You're listening to Alistair Begg on Truth For Life and a message titled, Jesus the Preacher. This is part of a series called The Pastor's Study, Volume 3. In the event that you joined us late today, you can hear this message free of charge at truthforlife.org. For now, keep listening. We'll hear a closing prayer from Alistair in just a minute. As Alistair said, a pastor's primary duty is to equip his flock for the work of ministry, which means we're all called to ministry, regardless of our vocation. This is a task that can feel overwhelming for any of us at times. 
dedicating ourselves to ministry work while we juggled the responsibilities of a full-time job or a healthy family life? Well, that can be challenging. If you are searching for a more peaceful balance in your life, we want to recommend a book titled Reset. This is a book written by David Murray, and it addresses the topic of burnout. Often, both in full-time ministry and in the workplace, we find ourselves stretched too thin, taxed to our limits emotionally, physically, and spiritually. David Murray offers practical insight to achieve a healthy, sustainable pace so we can be more effective for the gospel. He calls it a grace-paced life. We believe this book will be an invaluable resource for you. Today is the last day we're making it available, so be sure to get in touch. You're welcome to request a copy when you donate to support this ministry. Truth For Life is entirely listener-funded. Your gifts really do have an impact. When you give, you're helping more people have access to clear, relevant Bible teaching. And the thanks we receive from them belongs to you. To make a donation right now, call 888 888- Five eight eight seven eight eight four. That's eight 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 five eight eight seven eight eight four. Or if it's easier, you can give online at truthforlife.org. Remember to request your copy of the book Reset by David Murray. If you'd prefer to mail your donation along with your request for the book, write to Truth for Life at P.O. Box thirty nine eight thousand, Cleveland, Ohio four four one three nine. Now, before we conclude, here's Alistair. Father, we do thank you again for the Bible. We thank you that all of the clarity and all of the authority is to be found in Scripture. It's easy for us to clutter it up and to muddy it up. And we pray that you would help us so to be students of your Word and so to be those who are filled with your Spirit, that we might be better able to give ourselves to the task to which you have called us. We do find ourselves saying with Paul, who is uh, able for such a task? Who is sufficient for these things? Already our minds have run forward to Sunday, and we know what awaits us. We know some of the things that we still have to accomplish before then. We know that if our congregations ever knew what we were really like, they wouldn't even listen to us preach. We also know that if we knew what they were really like, we'd probably never preach to them. This is a mystery. We pray, Lord, that you will revive our hearts in the midst of the years, that you will fill us afresh with your Spirit, that you will close in with us, that we might know what it is for you to come and make your home with us, and that it may be out of the overflow of a genuine, ongoing, developing walk with you, Lord Jesus Christ, that we then bring the word to bear upon our people. I pray, Lord, for each of these men and for the church families that they represent and will represent. And we pray together that we might strengthen one another's hands in the gospel. And now may the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us his peace. Today and all the days of our uncertain earthly pilgrimage and then forevermore. Amen. I'm Bob Lapine. Tomorrow, Alistair continues this series called The Pastor's Study, describing how, in Christ, our greatest weaknesses actually become our greatest strengths. Be sure to listen Tuesday. The Bible teaching of Alistair Begg is furnished by Truth For Life. Where the learning is for living.